What is up my friends? My name is Kim and if you like true crime like I do, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. I post two times a week and you don't want to miss a thing. I hope you are having a fabulous day today. So I have a serious obsession with the psychology of a serial killer. Not the actual murders themselves, but the psychology. I watch endless interviews to study both expressions, the words that they say, and any kind of body language that I can pick up. And Jeffrey Dahmer is notorious for his interviews. And I feel like I may have watched all of them. This case was suggested from my friend Curdy. This is for you, bud. So today we are going to be talking about the infamous worst person by the name of Jeffrey Dahmer. Let's get into it now. Let's start with some characteristics of a serial killer. This is the information with a quick Google search of traits of a serial killer. This is what pops up, these 10 different stereotype if you must. This is not Bible, but here are the top 10 characteristics a serial killer may have. Number one, statistically speaking, the average serial killer is a white male from a lower to middle class upbringing. In fact, over 90% of serial killers are men. Number two, most serial killers are in their 20s or 30s. Number three, most are single or divorced. Check. As children, soon-to-be serial killers often torture animals. More than 60% of serial killers wet the bed beyond the age of 12. Not Jeffrey Dahmer. Many serial killers are obsessed with starting fires. Couldn't find any history of that. Many serial killers have an extraordinarily high IQ. In fact, Jeffrey Dahmer has an IQ of 145, which would put him at a genius level. A lot of serial killers come from dysfunctional families with an absent father. Well, Dahmer did not come from a family with an absent father, but I would say there was some dysfunction. Many serial killers suffer through childhood abuse. I wouldn't classify Jeffrey as being abused. Serial killers often have a history of trying to take their own lives. That does not apply for Jeffrey. I find that type of information interesting. I don't know if you guys do or not, but I just like to see the similarities and what traits they have. But let's get in to who Jeffrey was. Jeffrey Lionel Dahmer. He was born on May 21st, 1960 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. According to Jeffrey's father, Lionel, his mother suffered bouts of partial paralysis during the pregnancy. Doctors were unable to find any reason for the paralysis. She was given injections of barbiturates and morphine, which would finally relax her. Overkill, if you ask me. 1962, the Dahmers moved to Ames, Iowa so Jeffrey's father could work on his PhD in chemistry. Jeffrey's father was very smart, uh, not unlike Jeffrey. Jeffrey's father was a well-educated man who did pretty well for himself. In 1964, Jeffrey was diagnosed with a double hernia in his scrotum. Surgery would correct it. His dad, Lionel, said this is when he changed, became more and more withdrawn and introverted. He was four, so how true could that be? At four-year-olds this age, children change dramatically, and they change overnight. So I don't know if four, you could really figure out that their personality change, but I don't know. He was the parent, and, and that's the information. I feel like he's making excuses, but that's just me. In December of 1966, Jeffrey would name his brother. His, his parents allowed him to do that. December 18th is when he was born, but he named him David out of all names. Hmm. In 1968, the family moved to Bath, Ohio. 
Jeffrey's father had reported that Jeffrey was sexually abused by a neighbor boy at this time. Jeffrey himself claimed not to remember this as happening. I feel like Lionel was trying to paint a picture of excuses for his son. I cannot blame him. He loved his son, but sometimes I question his truth. Late in 1970, Jeffrey's mother was hospitalized twice for psychiatric problems. She would attempt to take her own life. During Jeffrey's high school years, he built a reputation of, of a class clown for his pranks and very heavy drinking since the age 14. Some of his pranks, such as shouting things out at strange times, making sheep noises, and faking epileptic fits. Jeffrey tried hard to fit in, but wasn't very successful. He was withdrawn and distant. Appears he couldn't make real connections with his classmates. Dahmer was interested in his shed of chemistry projects of dead animals and didn't have anyone that was interested in this like him. He would pick up roadkill, dissect, put them into mason jars, and this was a long time hobby for Jeffrey. In 1978, June 4, Jeffrey graduated from high school. His parents were going through an extremely bitter divorce. His mom decides to move out of the home because his dad, Lionel, got the home in the divorce. She did not tell Lionel she was leaving, so Jeffrey was left in the home alone for approximately six weeks. Jeffrey was 18 at the time, but Jeffrey was not taking the divorce well. So even though he was considered an adult, he may have needed emotional support that was not being met. Due to the bitter divorce, his parents were occupied with their own issues. June 18, 1978, Dahmer picked up 19-year-old Stephen Mark Hicks. Stephen was hitchhiking. They went back to Jeffrey's house for a few beers. When Hicks tried to leave, Dahmer clubbed him with a barbell and strangled him with it. Over the next couple of weeks, he methodically stripped the flesh from the bones. Once the bones were exposed, he smashed them and disposed a few of the remains in the backyard. Dahmer said he killed Hicks because he didn't want him to leave. Jeffrey knew this man was not gay, as Jeffrey was. Jeffrey's intentions were never to let him walk away. He had fantasized about killing. He took his once hobby of killing neighborhood animals and roadkill to his own human chemistry project from start to finish. So the idea he just didn't want him to leave is debatable. He could have just wanted to kill him if you leave the romance out. <laughs> Jeffrey would later state he didn't much like the killing, but it was just a means to a dead body that sexually satisfied him. Jeffrey's motives for all of his kills were all sexually motivated. This achieved full satisfaction for Jeffrey. Jeffrey graduated high school and his father would attend graduation with him. His mom and brother had already fled, so they weren't in attendance at his graduation. Lionel was concerned about Jeffrey, so he encouraged him to enroll in Ohio State University. He stayed only one semester before dropping out. This was the start of failed attempts to become a good member of society for Jeffrey. Christmas Eve, 1978, Lionel, his father, remarried. Jeffrey and his stepmother's relationship seemed to be okay. I couldn't find any reports of tension between the two of them. Because Jeffrey didn't do well in school, Lionel now suggested Jeffrey go into the army. So on December 29th, 1978, Jeffrey was sworn into the army. He was trained as a medic and assigned to Bumholder, Germany. In the army, Jeffrey's drinking became more prevalent in his life. He was being more known for a violent drunk than his typical class clown he used to be. Although heavy drinking was prevalent in the army, Jeffrey was excessive even by those standards. To no one's surprise, on March 26th, 1981, Jeffrey was discharged from the army before 
his enlistment was up because his drinking had reached the point where he simply didn't function anymore. The army provided him with a plane ticket to wherever he wanted to fly. So he went to sunny Florida. He got a job, rented a hotel room, but because his drinking was so bad and most of his money was going for his alcohol habit, he couldn't pay for the room and so he was evicted. He would call his dad for help and he returned to Ohio to live with his dad and his stepmom. This did not last as Jeffrey was drinking heavily and his dad couldn't take it anymore. He tried to take him to AA, but it didn't stick for Jeffrey. Jeffrey's dad, at his wit's end, sent him to live with his grandma. Like, you couldn't deal with him, so you sent him to live with, your, with his grandma? Mm. Jeffrey's grandma had a strong bond with Jeffrey and is believed she was the only one who really took interest in Jeffrey. Jeffrey started going to church with her, and him and his grandma were getting along really well, and it seemed like Jeffrey was getting it together. He stopped drinking. Things were looking up. But again, this didn't last, unfortunately. October 7th, 1981, Jeffrey's legal troubles started, and he was arrested for disorderly conduct and resisting arrest, but only had to pay a small fine of $60. He was heavily intoxicated at the time. August 7th, 1982, Dahmer was arrested again for disorderly conduct. He dropped his pants in public. Jeffrey was exploring different ways to feed his sexual desires to no avail. Jeffrey at one point stole a mannequin from a department store. He somehow snuck it out of the store, took it home, and he was using this as... A means of sexual pleasure. His grandma found it when she was putting away some Christmas decorations or something and so unfortunately he had to get rid of this mannequin. September 8th 1986 Jeffrey was arrested when he deliberately exposed himself while urinating or masturbating. There's two different stories it depends on what you believe. He was either urinating or masturbating in front of a group of children. Gross. Gross either way. Jeffrey changed things up. He became a fixture to gay bars and bathhouses. I never knew what a bathhouse was before Jeffrey Dahmer. Here's a clip if you live under a rock like I do. At its base, it's a sex club. So at its base, it provides a place where you could meet other men and, and that were also looking for sex with other men. But it was so much more than that. The, the bathhouses and the bars was, they were the only social institutions that we had at that time. So you're on the first floor of man's country, all the way to the rear we have this fetish area, and there's probably 10 rooms back here. This room has a St. Andrew's cross, so you could uh, tie a person up to the, to the cross and uh, play around with them. And then uh, in the rest of the fetish area, there's rooms with slings, rooms with shackles. Um, it's the fetish area. But at this bathhouse, Jeffrey decided he didn't like moving or noises from his sexual partners. They were willingly giving him sex for money, but he didn't like that. So he came up with the plan to drug his victims at the bathhouse with sleeping pills. Then he would sexually assault them. This apparently was doing it for him, but would not last as reports from employees came in with complaints about Jeffrey and he was banned from that bathhouse. No charges were filed, though one of the victims was hospitalized for a week. But it was a gay bathhouse, so... December 15, 1987, the murder of Stephen Tomey, age 24, Dahmer claimed he woke up in his hotel room and found the victim dead, with no memory of doing anything to him. He describes this in a manner of, oh my, I can't believe this happened again. I'm so disappointed in myself, type description. 
in my opinion. I have a hard time with this one, believing he didn't remember. And two, he stayed dormant for nine years. He really doesn't have a reason to lie at this point, but it is hard to believe with what we know now about him. So he brought a big suitcase, put the body inside of this suitcase, and brought it back to grandma's house. He left the body downstairs in the basement in this fruit cellar for about a week. After a week, he proceeded to dispose of it much as he had with the body of Stephen Hicks. He skinned the flesh from the bones, triple bagged it, wrapped the bones in newspaper, and used a sledgehammer to crush them up so he could dispose of them in the garbage. January 1988, James Dockstader, 14, was the next victim. Dahmer offered him money to pose for nude photos and took him back to his grandma's house. There is so much wrong with that statement. After sex, Dahmer drugged and strangled him, or vice versa. He was a necrophiliac, so it is possible more likely the sex could have happened before and after his death, but this is just how Dahmer reported it. At this point, Jeffrey started using acid to dissolve what could be dissolved and then crushing the bones because the bones will not dissolve in acid. So he would crush those up. March 24th, 1988, Richard Guardo, 25, came back to Dahmer's grandma's house for a nude photo. Jeffrey drugged and strangled the victim causing death. September, 1988, Dahmer moved into his own place Grandma did not like the men in and out of her house, as well as the smell that was coming from the basement and out of the garage. You poor grandma. Could you imagine that smell? Jeffrey now got a new Polaroid camera. I hate to say it, but every time I hear the sound of a Polaroid camera, I think of Jeffrey Dahmer. My brain is forever linked together. When I, a Polaroid means Jeffrey Dahmer, I don't know why, it's disturbing. In his new place, he offered $50 to a 13-year-old to pose nude for him, gave him a drugged drink, the young boy drank it, and Jeffrey Dahmer proceeded to fondle him. The boy was able to escape, and he went to the police, and Jeffrey was arrested. Jeffrey was losing control, in his new place. January 1998, Jeffrey was convicted of second degree sexual assault and enticing a child for immoral purposes. But his sentencing wouldn't happen until May 23rd. He was sentenced to five years and three years to run concurrently for his charges. I have never seen the point of concurrently, but it really doesn't matter because he actually only served 10 months and had work release with that as well. And then he had five years of probation and he had to register as a sex offender. But on March 25th, before his sentencing, in between the time he got arrested and sentencing, was March 25th. Anthony Sears, 24. Jeffrey met him at a club, took him back to grandma's house. Because he is now back living with grandma, he's no longer in his own place after his charges. He drugged Sears and murdered him. Jeffrey really liked this victim and found him especially attractive. He saved Sears' skull and would paint his skull to save. You know, to remember him? Why, when he was in jail, Grandma didn't go through his things? Because he had this school, like, packed away in his stuff. Like, this was the perfect opportunity for Grandma just to, like, go and check it out. Take a peek, you know? Fresh out of jail and learning nothing from his crime, uh, May 29th, 1990, Ricky Beats, 33 years old, Jeffrey met him in a club, offered him some money to pose for nude pictures. He drugged and strangled him, had sex with him, and he saved his skull as well. By the way, Jeffrey got a, a job and an apartment. He was working at the Ambrosia Chocolate Factory. Jeffrey would complain how he was sick of chocolate and the smell made him sick at times. 
I never heard him complain of the smell of decomposing bodies, though. Interesting. June 1990, Edward Smith, 28, was killed. Jeffrey took some pictures during the process of dismembering the body. I looked them up. I don't recommend it. Disturbing. Just don't do it. It's, it's bad. It's really, really bad. Why I even did it, I have no idea. I just didn't think they would be as bad as they were, but they were pretty bad. September 2nd, Ernest Miller, 24, was last seen alive. He met Dahmer in front of a bookstore. Dahmer offered him money to come back to his house. After sex, Dahmer drugged him and cut his throat. He took pictures of his body and dismembered it, putting the biceps in the freezer. He bleached the skeleton and painted the skull to save for later pleasure. Because Jeffrey had bodies building up in his apartment, Actual tenants called the office of the apartment building and complained because of the foul smell coming from Dahmer's apartment. And so they call Jeffrey and they're like, hey, we're getting complaints, your, your house, what's going on? And he said that his freezer broke. And so they asked him to you know, get rid of the smell, he said he would. So then a week goes by. Well, the smell is still there. And so they call him back. The office calls him back and says, hey, I thought you were going to clean that up. And he says, but hey, now my exotic fish tank, all my fish died. So that's what the smell is this time. For some reason, they bought what he was saying or really didn't care. I, either way, they didn't really do much, and that was that. September 24th, David Thomas, last seen alive. Dahmer met him on the street and offered him money to come home with him. Dahmer drugged Thomas, murdered him without sex, taking pictures as he dismembered the body. No sex. Hmm. March 7th, 1991. Curtis Strotter, 18. Dahmer picked him up at a bus stop, offered him money to come home with him. He drugged, strangled, sex, took pictures. The skull was found unpainted. I'm sure time was an issue for Mr. Dahmer, and I'm sure he just hadn't gotten around to it yet. So that was there, unpainted this time. This is at least three sequence of events Dahmer experienced than earlier. It had been sex, drug, then murdered. And then at one time he switched to drugs, murder, sex. And this is drugs, sex, and murder. So it's all over the place. He was experimenting. April 7th, April Lindsay, 19. Dahmer met him on the street and offered him money to come home with him. He drugged him, strangled him, had sex with, the, with his body. The unpainted skull was recovered. May 17th, Dahmer met 14-year-old Conorak in front of a mall and offered him money to pose for nude pictures. After the pictures, he drugged Conorak and went out to grab some beer. The boy escaped naked in the street. Neighbors called the police, but Dahmer happened to be walking back. If Dahmer would have been five minutes later, this boy would still be alive. But unfortunately, Dahmer came just at that time and he convinced the police that he knew this boy and that they were lovers and that they were just having a little quarrel. He had too much to drink and the police apparently unconcerned that this was a young boy was drugged. He, they couldn't confirm or deny his story. So Dahmer showed him pictures. And so then the police believed that this was his boyfriend and gave him back to Dahmer. So Dahmer, not long after the police left, he strangled him, dismembered him. His skull was recovered in the apartment. So there was a police officer. His name was John Balsarzak. He was fired because of Conorak. 
you know, because he gave the boy back to him. Despite that people were telling this officer, no, 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 don't let him go back there. The officer still did. So he was terminated, but then he was reinstated. Then he became president of the Milwaukee Police Association, which is the police union of Milwaukee. He did this from 2005 to 2009. He retired from the Milwaukee Police Department in 2017. How did he get his job? back and how did he become president of his union i don't know i don't have any details on it but the police department was sued for a large amount of money for that reason which was well deserved may 24th tony hudges 31 same pattern june 30th matt turner was 20 years old jeffrey put his head in the freezer his full head and the rest in a barrel of acid that he had obtained Jeffrey got this big blue barrel, the ones that you see in all the all the news reports and everything. They have the hazmat suits and they're bringing the barrel outside. This is the barrel that Jeffrey got. Um, he started using this method. July 6th, Jeremiah Weinberger, 23 years old. They met in Chicago, not even in Milwaukee at a gay bar, where Dahmer offered him money to come back to Milwaukee with him. This murder is very unusual in that this victim was not murdered until the day after he came home with Jeffrey. And it wasn't until the victim said he wanted to leave that Dahmer ended up drugging him, strangled him, and dismembered him, and took pictures of the process. Like the last victim, his head went into the freezer, his body into the acid. July 15th, Jeffrey Dahmer was fired from the Ambrosia Chocolate Factory for bad attendance. He, he would have to take the days off because he would kill this, these victims and then he needed to dismember them, he needed to take pictures, he needed to put them in this acid. I mean, he was busy, but he did miss too much work and so he was let go. So on that same day, he's having a bad day, and in Jeffrey fashion, what can cheer me up? He offered Oliver Lacey, 23 years old, who he had met on the street, if he wanted to come back to his apartment for what is described as body rubs. Lacey was then drugged and strangled. Dahmer had sex with the body before dismembering him. He put his head in the refrigerator and his heart in the freezer to eat later. In one of his interviews, uh, Dahmer would explain eating the heart is compared to filet mignon. It was tender. So while he's eating the heart, he would look at the pictures of his victims and then eat and then look at the pictures so he could experience the victim. I don't know. I think there's a such thing as too much information and I think that was it. July 16th, Joseph, 25 years old, same pattern. July 22nd, 1991, shortly after midnight, Tracy Edwards, 32 years old, escaped after being held hostage for five hours. He had one hand in a handcuff and was able to flag down a police car. He led the cops back to Dahmer's apartment to get the key. He felt comfortable going back with the officers, but he was scared. The key was in the dresser and Jeffrey tried to stop the police from getting it, but they passed him and they found the photos of the dismembered victims. They called for backup and they found body parts in the refrigerator, in the freezer. Shortly, the sight of crews in those news clips that you've seen in the protective suits taking evidence out of Dahmer's apartment. It was televised all over the world. The suits were necessary because of the smell of decay in the apartment and because of the acid in the barrel. So do, do you suppose that grandma was watching this thinking, I knew there was something off with that boy. Jeffrey had overwhelming evidence physical evidence galore against him. There was no point in him denying it. Jeffrey would confess to all of his murders, very unemotional. He would say he had no regrets. I noticed that when he made a shocking statement, he would say what others would want to hear, and then he would look up for an expression from his interviewer. 
it's almost like he's like, and I would do this. And he's like looking down. But when he says something that he thinks is going to provoke a reaction, he'll look up to see if it did or not. It's interesting. If you've ever seen an interview with Dahmer, you'll know exactly what I mean. So Tracy Edwards, I looked into him, you know, because he he's the one that stopped Jeffrey Dahmer. Who is this guy? I just wanted to know more information about him. So this Tracy Edwards guy, he apparently was charged with murder for pushing someone off of a bridge. So this happened 20 years after he escaped Dahmer. At the time of his arrest, he was 52 years old. He had been homeless and been traveling from homeless shelter to homeless shelter since 2002. So witnesses seen him standing on a bridge over the Milwaukee River. He was standing with two other homeless men. So a man across the street seen him push this man off of the bridge, which caused the man to die. The man drowned to death. So immediately after he came to the police, you know, his new fame of stopping the most infamous serial killer. Well, that fame apparently brought him some criminal charges right away. He was wanted for sexual assault of a 14-year-old girl. He was extradited back to take care of those charges. But what a crazy thing. You know, you always hear these surviving victims and you just want to hear the best. You know, that they're doing their best, they're living their best life or whatever but in this case this guy yeah he's kind of a piece of shit at least he stopped Jeffrey Dahmer if he accomplished anything in his life good job he took care of one big thing so he did he did do a great thing in his life for sure it's too bad that he went on to uh, potentially have murdered someone himself, but still. Tracy Edwards claimed he was never offered money in that he only wanted to go to Dahmer's apartment for some beers before going out again. He may have been covering his own indiscretion or Dahmer may have lied about the ways he lured people back to his, his apartment in order to make it seem like they're less of a victim or less innocent of a victim. Edwards was drugged, but he did not lose consciousness. This raises the possibility that the sedatives, the sleeping pills that Dahmer gave his victims were intended only to weaken them, that Jeffrey by this time knew how much it would take to do the trick. So he wanted them to be conscious during the attacks. I don't think this is very hard to believe that he liked that control. He liked that fear. You hear that a lot. So I don't think Jeffrey was different in that way. Jeffrey gave the impression that he had to get drunk to be able to kill. But as we know, Jeffrey had been drinking since the age of 14. So he just was an alcoholic and a serial killer. One had nothing to do with the other. Although they're two mental illnesses, I don't think they were linked together. I think he was just an alcoholic and he was just a serial killer. Just that simple. And like most alcoholics, making excuses for your drinking was normal for Jeffrey Dahmer. It's just what you do as an alcoholic. January 14, Dahmer entered a plea of guilty, but he was insane, he said. In 15 of the 17 murders, he claimed he had committed that he was insane for. February 1992, by a vote of 10 to 2, majority vote, a jury found Dahmer to be sane in every murder. Jeffrey was sentenced to 15 consecutive life terms. At the sentencing, Dahmer read a prepared statement in which he expressed sorrow for the pain he had caused. Your Honor, it is over now. This has never been a case of trying to get free. I didn't ever want freedom. Frankly, I wanted death for myself. This was a case to tell the world that I did what I did not for reasons of hate. I hated no one. I knew I was sick or evil or both. Now I believe I was sick. 
The doctors have told me about my sickness, and now I have some peace. I know how much harm I have caused. I tried to do the best I could after the arrest to make amends, but no matter what I did, I could not undo the terrible harm I have caused. I feel so bad for what I did to those poor families, and I understand their rightful hate. I decided to go through this trial for a number of reasons. One of the reasons was to let the world know that these were not hate crimes. I wanted the world in Milwaukee, which I deeply hurt, to know the truth of what I did. I didn't want unanswered questions. All the questions have now been answered. I wanted to find out just what it was that caused me to be so bad and evil. But most of all, Mr. Boyle and I decided that maybe there was a way for us to tell the world that if there are people out there with these disorders, maybe they can get some help before they end up being hurt or hurting someone. I think the trial did that. He later pled guilty to aggravated murder in Ohio in the death of the first victim, Stephen Hicks. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole. 957 years total for Jeffrey. Yeah, that should do it. November 28, 1994, Jeffrey was murdered in prison. Dahmer and two other inmates were assigned to clean the staff bathroom of Columbia Correction in Portage. Guards left him alone to do their work for about 20 minutes, starting around 7.50 a.m., when Jeffrey was discovered, he was unconscious and his head and face were bloody. He died on the way to the hospital from multiple skull fractures and brain trauma. A bloody broom handle was found near Jeffrey, but a broom is probably not sturdy enough to inflict the damage that killed him. Reports in December indicated that he was struck with a steel bar stolen from the prison weight room. One of the other two inmates in the area with Dahmer was also attacked. His name was Jesse Anderson, 37 years old, was pronounced dead in the hospital at 10.04 a.m. on November 30th. Anderson was convicted of stabbing and beating his wife to death in 1994. He was serving a life term. The third inmate in the work party is 25-year-old Christopher Scarver, a convicted murderer reported taking antipsychotic medication. This wasn't the first time Jeffrey had been attacked. A convicted drug dealer tried to cut his throat with a razor blade attached to a toothbrush handle, making a straight razor, but the weapon fell apart. Jeffrey received minimal injuries from that attack. Scarver is said to have delusions that he is Christ. He has been in psychiatric observation and treatment several times with a diagnosis of bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. He was found guilty of the murder of Jeffrey and was in prison. A jury apparently did not believe that he was insane. I looked up this Scarver guy, and this is kind of a side note, but it's kind of interesting too. Scarver is the second of five children and was born and raised in Milwaukee. He dropped out of school when he was in the 11th grade. Eventually, his mother forced him to leave the house because he was an alcoholic and it was increasing so his mom's like get out of the house scarver was hired as a trainee carpenter at a wisconsin conservation corps job program and he was said that he had been promised by edward patz his at the time it was his supervisor that on completion of the program that he would be hired as a full-time employee but Pats was let go, and as a result, Scarver's full-time position never materialized. And so Scarver was pissed about this. So on June 1st, 1990, Scarver went to the Wisconsin Conservation Corps Training Program office and found Steve Lohman, the supervisor who had replaced Edward Patz, Scarver demanded money from Lohman. Upon receiving only $15 from Lohman, Scarver shot him in the head. At the same time, he demanded money from the manager, John Fayum. According to authorities, Scarver said, do you think I am kidding? I need more money. 
And Scarver shot Loman, the man that he had already shot in the head, he shot him a couple more times to prove to the other guy, Fan, that he was serious. And so Fan wrote him a check for $3,000, and then Scarver just ran out of the building. Scarver was convicted and sentenced to life in prison, and he was sent to the same prison as Jeffrey Dahmer, so that's how they were in the presence of each other but how crazy is that i mean it's prison so of course they committed crimes but i'm like wow that's a crazy story because he didn't get a job in the one guy he only got 15 dollars the frick so scarver apparently kills jeffrey dahmer and then he returns to his cell early an officer asked him why he's not still working and during at the same time they found jeffrey dahmer and the anderson gentleman they found him as well Dahmer was declared dead an hour after arriving at the hospital. Anderson died two days later after being found. And after Scarver was found to, to be competent to stand trial, Scarver received two more life sentences for these murders. In 2005, Scarver brought up federal civil rights suit against the officials of the Wisconsin Secure Program Facility in which he argued that he had been subjected to cruel and unusual punishment contrary to his constitutional rights. Scarver stated that he spent 16 years in solitary confinement as a result of killing Dahmer. That'll teach ya. Probably not. A district court judge dismissed the suit against several of the defendants and ruled that the actions of remaining officials could not be considered unlawful. Scarver unsuccessfully appealed the decision in 2006. In 2012, an agent representing Scarver announced that Scarver was willing to write a tell-all book about his experience of killing Dahmer. This guy is a nut job and he's gonna write a book? Yeah, right. In 2015, it was reported that Scarver had believed that Jeffrey had no remorse for his crimes. He would say that Jeffrey would taunt fellow inmates by shaping prison food into several limbs and then drizzling ketchup on top of them to resemble blood. It was also reported that although Scarver had no interaction with Dahmer before killing him, he knew that Jeffrey was very unpopular within the fellow inmates. He had seen him get into several different altercations with other prisoners. It was reported that Scarver said he was revolted by Jeffrey's crimes and that he carried a news article in his pocket detailing his crimes. Immediately before murdering Dahmer, Scarver allegedly presented this news clipping to him and asked him, was it true? This sounds like a, a TV movie or something. Scarver was reported to have said that prison staff let him alone with Jeffrey because they wanted Jeffrey dead and they knew that Scarver hated him. In 2015 blog posts, Scarver disputed some of these statements. After her son's death, mom and dad of Jeffrey Dahmer engaged in a court battle over their son's remains. According to the Chicago Tribune, mom wanted her son's brain preserved and studied to determine if there was biological factors were behind her son's behavior. She thought maybe he killed because there was just something off with his brain and she wanted to get it studied. The brain was never studied because the court sided with Jeffrey's dad who wanted to cremate the body and the brain per Jeffrey's wishes. The ashes were split in between both the parents. Jeffrey's younger brother, David, he reportedly changed his name. He doesn't want any part of Jeffrey Dahmer's infancy. He just wants to be off on the sideline. I don't know you and I don't blame him. So it was interesting because I found one article that said before his death, Lionel and his wife, uh, Jeffrey's stepmom, were the only ones who would go and visit Jeffrey. The mom and Jeffrey, however, would talk on the phone. She would ask if he was safe and Jeffrey would say, he didn't care if anything happened to him. And I kind of believe that he really didn't care. I seen a court thing where this lady went bananas and Jeffrey just sat there like, go ahead, hit me. I don't care. 
like he was totally emotionalist. I'll try to play a clip. I may need to cut it out because of copyright, but I'll try to enter it. Never, Jeffrey. Jeffrey, I hate you. But what's interesting about Jeffrey's mom is just before Jeffrey was murdered in prison, Jeffrey's mom attempted to take her own life again. She turned on her gas oven and left the gas, the oven door open. And next to her was a side note that read, it's been a lonely life, especially today. Please cremate me. I love my sons. Jeff and David. She lived. There is so much information out there. Some of the information gets diluted or it gets built up or it gets changed. Like where Jeffrey Dahmer in the prison where he was actually killed. I've seen so many conflicting stories that I didn't even say where he was. Some reports said he was in the gym. Some said it was in the officer's locker room. I don't know. It's in the bathroom somewhere. <laughs> Let me know your guys' opinions. What do you guys think of this? I've been on here for a long time. Let me get out of here. If you guys have made it to the end, you guys are rock stars and I love you to death. There are more true crime videos in my Captured Killers playlist. If you are interested, please check them out. Either way, take care, my loves, and I'll see you in my next one. Bye.